Okay, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear. Okay. Good morning. This is the hearing. Mary? Attorney. Oh, Terry, why don't you take over? The All right, I will. That's okay, I'm going to start the hearing. Um, I'm going to read a letter from the governor. Uh, I am pleased to nominate Mary Glenn Cody. The president of court magistrate of the Berkshire District Juvenile Court, Berkshire Juvenile Court, I submit this nomination to the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm going to go on the nominee's resume for convenience. Sincerely, Charles Baker, Governor. Why don't you tell us who you have here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
Good morning, everybody. Um, this is my father, Albert Gallant, and this is my mother, Lynn Gallant. Right. And um, for the councils that are present in the room, everybody's here, but we have Council Ferrara, we have Council Ainala, we have Council Paul, and we have Council Juvenile. Um, have you, uh, we're going to start um, with your witnesses that I think are on Zoom, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, Judge Shaw, Judge, you can hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Judge, we'd love to hear from you. What would you like to say about the nominee? Uh, well, first, I'd like to say good morning to everyone and begin by thanking the Governor's Council, not only for uh, taking into consideration my comments today, but I also need to say that six years ago in May, I sat in that very same chair before you and was fortunate enough to be confirmed as Associate Justice of the Juvenile Court. Uh, I will forever but be- Just when you are here, you learn about the power of brevity, right? I did. Yes. <laughs> I get right to it. <laughs> Thank you for this one. <laughs> Well, I, I am very mindful of your time, and I have um, jotted down some notes, and I do intend to keep it brief, but um, I certainly could go on for hours about Attorney Galant Cody. She is just an outstanding candidate, and I'm thrilled that she sits before you today nominated for the clerk magistrate position. I just want to briefly point out that I was a D.C. attorney in Berkshire County for about 13 years. I was then assistant clerk magistrate in Hamden County for four years before being appointed to the bench. So I've had an opportunity to not only know Berkshire County well, but also observe Attorney Gallant Cody in her different roles from those different perspectives. I think that gives me a unique set of lenses to talk about her skills and abilities and the reason why I so strongly support her candidacy. One of the first reasons that I uh, shouldn't go without saying is that she knows the law, the rules, the statutes, the procedures inside and out. I find many times when she's presenting a case before me, I start to jot down questions, things that I want to ask before she's done. And usually by the time she's done, she's already answered every question that I had. Um, she thinks ahead, she strategizes, she's prepared for everything. And I see the skills as being necessary in a clerk magistrate. Another important set of skills that Attorney Blount Cody has is she is a real problem solver. She has the ability to stay calm when everyone else starts to escalate. And I think people are drawn to that calmness. With that, then, she can gather people together, identify problems, talk about possible solutions, and then make things happen. To me, that's a critical skill for a clerk magistrate. She also treats people with such tremendous respect. And I have seen her in situations where uh, parents who might have mental health issues or are in the throes withdraw from addiction uh, get pretty aggressive with her from the witness stand. And I am always amazed at her ability to remain calm, professional, and treat people with respect to the point that often that's what leads to resolutions that she's able to coordinate our own rather than relying on me as a judge to make those decisions. I appreciate when it's a particularly complex case, an attorney like Cody stands and says that she's there to represent the department because I know it'll be a steady hand guiding that case through the process and come up with a solution that's going to keep a child safe and work for everyone else involved. Um, lastly, I think one of the most important skills that she has is this ability to work across boundaries. You know, the court magistrate position is unique because they are part of triumvirate that make every court work. The judicial department, the probation department, and the court magistrate's office all have their own responsibilities. They all have boundaries that need to be recognized, and they all need to work together collaboratively in order to make a court work. And I can't think of a better person for Berkshire County to take on that role and do that work with the other departments. So for those reasons, and as I said, many more that I can describe, I wholeheartedly support her candidacy. I think she'll be a tremendous access to Berkshire County and to the juvenile court as a whole. I'm certainly uh, willing to answer any questions anyone might have, but I am mindful of your time. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, we're going to call next Dr. Paul Weiser, Professor of Economics, History, and Political Science at Fitzburg State College. It's a big title, Professor. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate your time this morning as well, um, and uh, I appreciate the judge's testimony uh, also. I'll be brief, too, uh, but I appreciate the chance to, to share my experiences with you today. Um, I, I've been married for them 20 years at this point, which does a lot. <laughs> I was just among the first cohort of students that I had the opportunity to work with when I came to Fitzburg State University, but she stood out right away from that group. When I started the MOOC program at the school back in the year 2000, Mary was one of four students on that inaugural team. She competed for two seasons in the American Court Association National Championship Tournaments, where she and her partner performed admirably and enjoyed great success. The experience allowed me to see firsthand how well developed at a very young age her skills were and how much potential she had, and I was very fortunate to have a very small role in helping her realize that, realize that potential. As our moot court program grew both in size and province, I began the practice of having Fitzburg State alums who did moot court as students come back and work with students as well and help in coding the teams. And Mary was immediately the first person I thought of and was amongst the first uh, to serve in that role. And getting a chance to work with her then in that professional setting further cemented the appreciation I have of her as an individual. She was quickly able to establish a natural rapport with our young advocates, where she has just a really good ability to connect. Um, she can at once be both authoritative and approachable, which is no small feat. 
She did a great job in breaking down complex legal arguments, making them understandable to non lawyers. And I said, people really understand the complex. I'm sorry. Um, a little uh, technical issue, but that's all. Okay, go ahead, Professor. I'll continue. Um, move forward as an activity, particularly at the undergraduate level. Also put competitors under great pressure and stress. Mary does a great job to help people deal with those emotions, yet still thrive and be able to process things in the moment. She showed great commitment to providing service to our program to the young people that we serve. Uh, she would drive more than an hour each way to help each our class, and I should point out that so over very little month. Um, her passion to the school and to the program and to, to helping um, young advocates develop their skills so they can follow the path that she did was evident, and I'm so appreciative of that. Uh, she served as coach in all five seasons until she had her own child, but she has remained actively connected to her state and court throughout her career. She didn't use to come back annually, serve to judge our renal competitions. She has recruited other legal professionals to do the same. It's her ongoing commitment to service was why I am here today with you. Um, I will say I followed her career from afar. Professionally, she's eminently qualified for this position. Um, I have served both a state certified advocate for the rights of children and then her current position working for DCF. She's been on both sides of the courtroom and they will clearly understand all perspectives that are involved. Having worked as a solo practitioner and a very large bureaucratic state agency, she should be able to work any type of setting and thrive in any type of setting. And finally, I just want to say that I find Ari to be of the highest personal integrity. Um, she is a, a very progressive individual. She's a very passionate individual. She is fully committed to seeing the development of each person as an individual. Uh, she has the right skill and the right temperament for this job, and she'll be an outstanding clerk magistrate. I recommend her to you without reservation. Thank you very much, Doctor. We appreciate your testimony. Does anybody have any questions of the doctor? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, ask if there's anybody in opposition to the nominee. Would you mind coming out and see if there's anybody waiting to come in and testify against you? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here and uh, we'll close that portion of the um, uh, hearing and at the full judge. Why don't you, you already introduce your plan, so go ahead. Okay, I would also like to be very, very mindful of your time. Just start by saying good morning um, to all of you. Uh, my sitting before you is truly a result of cumulative efforts on my behalf, as it is um, the result of my own efforts. Um, so several people I'd like to thank, but I will talk fast. Um, I'd like to thank Governor Charles Baker. Take all the time you need. Okay. And Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito for their faith in me making the nomination. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the Judicial Nominating Committee, the Joint Bar Committee, mm -hmm. Attorney Robert Ross and Lauren Green Petrino. Um, also to, to Attorney Green Petrino for her humor, her friends, and lots of guidance you provide to me through this process. I'd like to thank Emily Gothier and Caitlin Abbin for their assistance and their kindness, as well as Mary McCarthy for kindness and for assistance, especially with helping a witness be here virtually today. Um, I'd also like to really genuinely thank the council. Um, <clears throat> You know that it is not lost on me what enormous privilege and honor it is to sit before you, and I really mean that. Sometimes I kind of can't believe that I'm here. Um, and I thank you so much for your time, your consideration of the nomination, and thank you to Councillor Hurley also for her advice um, and her guidance through this process. I want to thank colleagues both at DCF, in the defense bar, and judges of both Hamden County and Berkshire Juvenile Courts. They are, they are an unspeakably dedicated group of people to juvenile court work, which is sometimes routed in history, um, and that it's confidential. But I can tell you the people working in those courts are um, pushing hard and hard to make things better every day, and I'm uh, very lucky to have part of that. I'd like to thank witnesses Dr. Paul Weiser and Judge Harold Shaw so very much uh, for their years of maturing and guidance through my whole career, as well as the process. They've both been invaluable to me, and I'm so, so grateful for their kind words and their time. Um, with respect to my family, I just want to thank my husband, Robert, since I decided to pursue this opportunity. I very much introduced additional stress in the household that may not have otherwise existed, but he's been really unflappable and supported me in my career, and I'm so grateful for him. Also to his parents, who I know are watching, hello. Um, they've provided so much support and lots and lots of child care, and uh, I'm so grateful to them. They're incredibly important people in my life. Um, to our son, Sully, um, I hope that he thinks I am cool now because I'm on YouTube. That's my third fish for today. Um, I love so much. The best thing I ever did, and it's an honor to be your mother. And finally, to my parents, Albert and Linda, um, they are the foundation on which everything I have built truly is built. Um, I have a lot written about them, but I'm not going to say it all um, because I won't cry. They're, they're the hardest working, most dedicated people I've ever met. They sacrificed enormous, enormous amounts for my brother and I to be successful. They came from very humble backgrounds and just worked were from the ground up their whole lives. They were an example, um, and growing up, the family I grew up in was truly my greatest blessing. They taught me uh, so much about just pushing through life, working hard, believing the ability to overcome odds, achieve success. Um, through my academic years in high school, I was not very academically minded. I was not a stand-up academically or athletically or any way. And when I graduated, I said, well, I'm just going to get a job. I'm not going to go to college. And they were like, huh, that's, that's a fun story, and that's not happening. And um, I left Fitcher State College with no loans because they, my whole life, put their money where their health is. They paid for a college degree to make sure I got it. So I can't pay enough homage to them, truly. Um, my, my path to law school was kind of a strange one. After college, I worked at Hertz Rentar for a while. I built character. Uh, I watched a lot of cars. It was an interesting 
path and that finally, you know, a voice in my head that had come from Dr. Weiser and other people in my life said, you know, you've got to go to law school. It's really what you want to do. And I finally got, I think, courage to go. And um, I did some internships, worked at Western Mass Legal Services, the DA's office. And once I was in the courtroom, I was absolutely hooked. Um, I, I knew that that's where I belonged. I started largely in private practice doing divorce and criminal defense, which I enjoyed and worked really hard at, but I don't know that I ever felt it was my niche. But I can say that um, the juvenile court, when I first was introduced to work there, uh, became really my home away from home for the last 10 years, and I, I wouldn't have any other way. Um, it's interesting and challenging, and the high rate of litigation really satisfied me professionally, but it's also become very personal to me. Um, the cases there just have hearts, families at stake, there's children at stake. Um, and I've always fought hard on my clients, but those cases really took on weight and mean for me. And it's been uh, almost a decade of hard work and often heartbreak, but I know juvenile court is where I belong and where I want to stay. Um, two more skins. Uh, to be the clerk magistrate in the juvenile court is really the culmination of all professional and personal interests. I don't want to do the job for the prestige or the salary, both of which are wonderful, um, but I really want to be part of the system in a different way where I can try to implement things that make, um, that make the lives of young people better. So I am privileged and proud to be here and happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Council Herrera, I'm, I'm sitting maybe slot, so it's the person her right that will go. So you're up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, wow, you're really fast talker. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't have any questions for you. Uh, Counselor Early uh, is a big fan of yours. Uh, you've been in court in the juvenile court every day for years. Uh, clearly, you know what you're doing, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so you work for her? Yes, I did. They have an ad, they have a guy in a chair that would come and sit in the moving car. I think O.J. Simpson had been a guy in a chair back then. You never in the chair and... I did not. I was in the garage, literally screaming and vacuuming. Yeah, no, I wasn't in the middle. I think you're... Uh, Extremely well, and you've got a background for juvenile court, and you're very uh, um, into such uh, that court. And people in that court find just so dedicated to that court, and to really, uh, and I go and I don't much when I go and I get that feeling from it. But it's going to be a great fit in this field. When I'm out there in a few weeks, I'll let you run there. I have coffee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Just as I meet you, I think he had to come for that. <laughs> um, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, first of all, um, how, how did before the days, how many are there? How many? Oh, um, 12. I believe. I believe it's 12. 12, yeah. Well, it's too much to be there. But I can't do anything about it. <laughs> but um, so, so tell me, um, how did you, well, I like your background. Um, the Department of, you know, I can't so much. I'm not a fan. Yes. I think of how many. We go, it all so many that, that you know help them. So um, I'm just wondering if you could be candid. How do you think that? How do you think that could be improved? So that's a big question. Um, obviously, the Department of Children and Families is an enormous agency. Um, and there's so many different factors in how they operate and what they do. I think that um, what I would want to say, and not to simply just sort of be defensive of them, but, but truly to put out there that I know the public hears about tragedies and there are undoubtedly tragedies, but there's so much work that goes on in the department. There's so many success stories, um, and you know we won't hear about those, but like any agency, um, certainly it can be uh, improved. And I think there's things right now we're having um, to work on improving it, and things that I would want to continue to be part of. I know there's a, an initiative right now, the Pathways Initiative, and it was implemented by Chief Justice Nectum and, and Judge Shaw, and it really to hold in Berkshire's a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And what it is, is it, it's a different way of approaching the civil side of the juvenile court so that cases are categorized differently from the moment that um, they come into court. So typically there's sort of a long track of a lot that's involved in a case and I won't belabor all the details of, of that work, but um, the pathways model looks at the case differently right from the beginning and says, okay, this is a brand family to the department. There's really not a huge amount of risk factors, but they need help. You know, it's maybe a single mother who has maybe a domestic violence situation or, or you know, it's really suffering from the effects of poverty. It puts the case on short track and it puts teens sort of intensively working with that family, monitor risk and really understand what the family needs. And then alternatively, when there's a case where the risk factors are very, very high, mm -hmm. where there's a very long history, maybe prior terminations of rights, very significant substance use histories, incarcerations, violence, things like that, it's, it's also put on a different track, uh, and again, more intensive track, but in a different way, so that there are a different level of monitoring on that case, both at the department from the judicial perspective, um, and the expectations are different about how that case is going to move through the court. And it's really a way of acknowledging that these cases are, are not cookie cutter, they're not all the same. And I think by putting prioritizing things based on the issues specifically presented by the case, makes the system more efficient for the families involved and for the stakeholders involved, and also puts resources on um, the where they're to fill out the center. You know, getting back to me, I don't understand why the uh, department didn't get involved in that when it went to Massachusetts court, because um, history was that was um, violent. Mm -hmm. He admitted he beat her. Mm -hmm. Special needs, find a way. And you made her clean toilet with the toothbrush. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was, they, they were in the middle of getting a report if the house, if the home safe for her to go with that. Right. He didn't make 
That's where it should have ended. I don't blame anyone else, but I blame that judge. And I called because I said, you should not be recalled, judge. You don't, you don't, um, how can I say, if you had a child that misbehaved, you don't, you know, don't reward them. Mm -hmm. So why would you reward this person? That poor little baby, from the time she was two months old, why didn't they, why didn't they have a safe um, cost home to be loved? She never had that. Well, I certainly don't have any inside information. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, okay. That's just one example. So I understand what what's going on. But, um, you know, um, so um, wh what is your criteria for removal of a child? So the legal standard is whether a child um, is at imminent risk of abuse and neglect in, in their family home. That's the legal standard, whether um, removal is issued. You know, in this pandemic, that was my, I, I said it, I said to my children, I worry more about the children being abused because we don't know, you don't know what they are. And babies, we have no idea. But if they were school age, maybe go to school, they would show some symptoms of, of the, the teacher would say, so we lost a lot in that pandemic. I'm very yeah, concerned about. Now, um, okay, uh, you have your sequel of writings. Tell me about that, about the father. Uh, do you, uh, you know, try and get his older children? Tell, tell us that. Oh, um, so that's one of the first cases I ever did in the juvenile court. Um, and it was a written fiction, and I can't provide a lot of identifying information, but it was a situation where a um, child accused father of, of sexual abuse. And I wrote about that case only because it was the first real connotation I had with just how complex the circumstances could be, you know, trying to root out facts and the different players in the case had very strong positions on, on what should happen. Um, but it was a case that really challenged me professionally um, because it's a difficult subject matter. And it really taught me, you know, that you have to fight for your client. I did believe the result of the case was just personally. Um, he did reunify with his other children. And my understanding is that they've all gone on to be very happy and successful. Um, I wrote about that case specifically because I think as lawyers and in case jobs clerk master, you can find really, really difficult situations, things that are not comfortable to talk about and not comfortable to exist. But that was a real example of me sort of maintaining professionalism, working within the system, you know, despite a really difficult set of facts. When uh, a case remains open, um, and so um, what happens to the child in question at that time? Because, um, you know, you had a case uh, 2021, um, 11 consecutive days, and the case is still out there. What happens to the child? Because um, it's about parental rights and the child's mother. So in the meantime, where was the child? The child was with family the entire time, about the entirety of the case. He was um, in an uninterrupted placement through the department with a very close family member. That family member actually um, going to be the child's permanency resource, meaning they're adopting him. So that was a, a very solid, good situation where despite the complexity of legal situation that was surrounding him, he was just living with family, going to school, going to camp, you know, child life. Of course, it's affected by proceedings. I would never say otherwise. But he, you know, he really maintained, a was maintained in a loving home, and he still is, and is doing wonderful. But sexual abuse is something a child has its run. And um, we talk about it to you, and we met day for all the time. Um, he had a friend, and his daughter was at the day, day here, such as a big, it was very publicized in Medwood. And, um, and she was three years old. And she used to come home sometimes with someone else's panties, some with blender pants, sometimes, um, it, well, anyway, it, it turned out that he was guilty as true, he was guilty, and so um, it came before us, and uh, if the governor had voted yes, then it would come before us, but voted no, but um, that girl is a woman now, she's a person special, she's in, in California, and she's never had a lasting relationship, she's been gay twice, mm -hmm. and it affected her life, all her life to be abused, sexually abused. So I just think, um, you know, it, it's so important who we have, because we're hearing this all the time, in schools and everything, they're everywhere. So um, so tell me, how, how did you get into this legal um, work, that would have happened you to do this? So I started, um, as I said, largely in probate family court, doing divorces and custody guardianships and things like that, and then um, just by way of referrals from a colleague, I think is how I got the first care protection case in juvenile court, I would say it was around 2009, and I just... I, I don't know if I can pinpoint why it was fit, but I really liked it. I liked the judges, I liked the body of law that runs the juvenile court, I liked the people I was working with there, and I liked, I, I, this is going to sound very cheesy, but I felt like from an advocate standpoint, you could really, really make a difference in the juvenile court. It's not work that attracts a lot of people. Um, it's kind of the third rail sometimes, I don't know that people love it there, but um, I just really felt like I connect with it. So I did it privately for a few years as I came in here and there, and then in 2013, um, I went through the CCS training to be certified to take Basically, our advocate, but for the juvenile court, represent children, family, uh, children, parents. Um, after that certification, and up until I took a job at ECM in 2016. Um, what what changes would you like to make in um, if you could in the agency that that oversees you know um, children and, and families? Um, you must have seen it, and I know it's happy to say that now. But there are cases that fall with the press and and. You know, they, they don't even know that person. The child's not 
at a home or whatever. You see this uh, a problem, is it? It's been going on for years. Mm -hmm. I know Jeff Block, when he was there, mm -hmm. he did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. He really did. He worked hard, helped a lot of people. He helped a lot of women mm -hmm. who had, had been prostitutes and their children taken away. He has rehabilitated and gave him a home and everything. He's done a lot of those things. So I know that's the good part, but I'm very upset about what we hear in the present. Right. You know, and um, uh, that's it. And, and like I said, the pandemic really concerned me. Like, I don't know. How did you operate the pandemic? So the department operated largely virtual during the pandemic. Um, home visits and, and visits were in uh, over Zoom, largely. Um, there were circumstances where um, the commissioner would authorize people to go into the homes and, you know, circumstances where there's a, we were aware of a very high risk or emergency situation. Um, but it was largely virtual. I will say that um, following some of the, you know, tragedies that have been publicized, the department has made some um, strides in that area to try to make things better. I know that recently impl implemented a new unification policy that's been rolled out, yeah. and what that did require high levels of management to, reviewing, be, to review a situation where a child is on the way home, the reunification process, and it also involves the legal team in a way that it might not ordinarily have been. So now before a decision is made to send a child home, there's a much more comprehensive review of the case at a higher level of legal and clinical management to ensure that that's safe. So there, there, there's a lot of things that are being worked on to improve you know, the I like the idea that you were in private practice, so uh, it, tell me, how, how does that add to your ability to declare magistrate? Sure, well, I think private practice is kind of a whole different beast. And um, what I would say first is that really logistically, um, I think a lot of the skills translate. I have to do all of my bookkeeping, record keeping. I had a part-time employee at one point, so having payroll, tax, and all those things. So, you know, of course, I'm not a small scale in a clerk magistrate office. So, do you know what you're going to yes. right? Um I actually um, volunteered for a year in the court um, as a volunteer counselor, juvenile on probation. And, you know, from my little world with four children and, you know, never really went, we didn't even have a car, so everyone went for a ride. I have a stereotype about juveniles, and I got to know each of them one-on-one, -on one-on-one, -on -one. Mm -hmm. and it took a long time to get confidence. And some of the horrific stories, yes. lives that they lived, teenage girl locked in her room, while her mother's a prostitute, and up the night she doesn't know who her father is, mm -hmm. those are the things that people really don't understand. And, um, uh, it was uh, it was a good experience for me because how would I ever be you know uh, see that? So um so um when you think of all positions, what do you think gives you the most uh, out of that to to be a successful clerk magistrate? I think definitely my work as a defense attorney in the juvenile court because that was an opportunity for a lot of years where I got to know the, the people as, as human beings and not as a caseload, which at the department sometimes it's more of a caseload situation. But on the defense side, you know, I work with, I represent a lot of children who um, have had the type of life that you've described. You're in there and you're in foster home with them. You're getting to know them as a person and talking about their problems in school, their problems at home, what they need to do better. Um, and so also working with parents, you know, there's a lot of stigma about a lot of these parents who have horrible addiction issues, they're stuck in a cycle of violence, you know, they really have struggled, and it's a, it's a balancing act, the right for children. Your children would say, you have a spouse that killed the other one. Tell us about that. That's right. Counsel, um, the 15 minutes is expired uh, time, so we're going to have to count by and all. Count by and all. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, uh, I spoke with Counsel Hurley, sorry, uh, stress support if you guys, uh, great to see you, uh, to get down to the next time, I just want to share with you, uh, great, uh, just to listen to me. Your name comes first this week. I'm more happy to support you. Thank you very much, Council. So, Doug. Thank you. Um, you're in the League Qualified List, too. I have some questions for you. Thank you so much. I actually find your resume a bit refreshing in some of the practical Thank you. Your life experience. Uh, I think it's very relevant to. I'm sorry, um, to me, she's, she's, but I find it very relevant to position. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Thank you Council Follow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just ask you a couple of questions. Um, you work with the CRAs. Yes. Have you ever uh, observed judges putting uh, conditions on CRAs that you found inappropriate? Yes. And what would have been the basis for you finding them inappropriate? I think what's difficult um, in CRA situation is I, I do feel, and this with the greatest due respect to the, the judges, a position I have not served in, um, is that I think there's an expectation that kids that are really struggling and then follow more rules and, and more guidelines and more impositions. And I don't think it addresses the struggle. Um, is, is that a false assumption that kids can do that? Is it a false assumption that kids will respond with new rules and new expectations? I don't know that I'd go so far as to say false. I know there are certainly some kids who thrive within the structure, but I do think um, that there's a, you know, a fair amount of research that shows us that a different approach might be more effective. 
Have you today um, any group homes where folks uh, with children in yes. the area state would be sent? Represent many adolescent boys um, on the CPC side or in group homes that would meet them there regularly, yes. And so that would inform your work as a Absolutely. straight I presume. Absolutely. Uh, and how about Grafton Job Corps? Did you meet a lot of children there who um, were also quite involved? Um, my role with them wasn't really, that was a very entry level position um, when, I, when I worked there, but they were, um, a lot of them had come through the foster care system or were involved, yes. Um, those kids, I will say, were super inspirational, mm -hmm. um, but that was really my first foray to kind of understanding that whole other world, you know, that lived up there. And those kids, um, a lot of them were stars. They were really determined to make something out of their lives and, and they were doing it, you know, they were inspirational. Just one last question. So, um, in group homes, and I've worked in school settings as well, when kids have court dates coming up, their behavior and the dysregulation escalates out of time. Yes. And oftentimes that behavior and dysregulation is reported to the court. Yes. And they face consequences for it when in fact the inciting incident of the behavior was in fact the actual court date itself. Yes. You find that to be true? I find that to be true, yes. For your work as work master? Absolutely, yes. I have no further questions. Thank you, Councilor DePaul. I, I would normally be next, and I don't have any questions for you. I can tell you that Councilor Hurley is a big fan of us. I spoke with her. I had to take with her here because the uh, issue she had, and then we had the um, technical issues. I think she's coming back on. Mary, you back on? I'm here. Although, no. Oh, good. Mary, you're up. We're all done except for you. Well, um, I want you close up the hearing, you don't have to know. say anything. I always Mary, you're going in Terry, know that. Oh, darn. Mary, you, Mary, we're having trouble. You're going in and out, so. I think. I think it's a great job. I Hi. Right, I'm putting up speech. Say what you want to say because we can't hear you on the Zoom. Go ahead. I think we're a great candidate. You've got the support of this council from what I've heard. I'm sorry that my video and audio did not work, but I think Mary did a good job. Thank you, Mary, and did a good job as well. Okay. You've been a great supporter of us, Mary. And um, we're going to close the hearing because the LG is coming in now. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for your.